G'day, Dr. Carl here, and the theme is big. Big monsters, big aliens, big friendly monsters, bad monsters, big robots helping us, just plain big. Could a giant prehistoric shark be surviving somewhere deep in the ocean where humans cannot or do not go? Now, Megalodon, been around since about 26 million years ago to about two and a half million years ago. Don't know why they died out. Might have been due to the Milankovitch effect in the beginning of the ice ages on the Earth. Don't know, doesn't matter. 20 metres, 100 tonne, teeth as big as that. You have to eat to support a 100 tonne body at least a tonne per day. You eat 1% of your body weight. And that one tonne of fish would have to eat every day, so 400 tonnes a year. You need a whole food chain underneath it to support it. Deep down on the ocean floor, where the water is really cold, there ain't a lot of fish. And we would have noticed that you need a huge number of smaller critters to feed one big critter. Other thing, the oxygen demands. So is it possible? Yes. Likely? No. Lots of fun? Sure. Godzilla. Can radiation from atom bombs, etc., mutate a creature into becoming horrendously large? Well, yes and no, but mostly no. Mutation to make you bigger is tricky because there's not a single gene with a volume knob that you turn up. Sure, we make growth hormone and it comes out of this part of your brain in there, but having more growth hormone doesn't make you bigger. It just makes you sort of get wider. There's a condition called acromegaly, which most people notice by the fact that they can't take their wedding ring off anymore. In the Galapagos Islands, there is one creature we don't understand, and that's a little tortoisey, turtley thing, the, the iguana. And when times are bad, it actually shrinks by 20%. I'm not saying that it loses one-fifth of its body weight. No, the bones get shorter. The joints get shorter. The whole creature shrinks by one-fifth and can get bigger. So I would have originally said, nah. But now if I think about the marine iguana, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Now, to recreate a human being or to create a human being, you need DNA. Where are you going to get dinosaur DNA from? And they put forward the hypothesis that 100 million years ago, a mosquito landed on a dinosaur, got some blood. While flying around, she lands on a bit of tree. The sap flows at incredibly high speed over. She gets caught, gets turned into amber. And uh, 100 million years later, we drill down, get the blood, get the DNA, and then magically grow one. Possible? You're pushing it, but... There is another option. You see, the dinosaurs didn't die out 65 million years ago. The birds survived. Birds are dinosaurs. I mean, have a look at them there. They've got this weird beak and they've got this thing up here and they, they, they don't look like us. They're not us. They're dinosaurs. They're very different from us and they've mutated a bit over the uh, remaining period, but they are dinosaurs and buried in their DNA but put asleep could be some lynx to where they evolved from. But there's another factor, the practical, ethical, environmental considerations. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Jeff Goldblum says, just because we can, should we? And you think about it, you got one dinosaur. Okay, it's going to be very lonely. Okay, suppose you have a whole family of dinosaurs. Okay, that's better, they can interact with each other, but they don't have any societal training from their parents on how to behave with each other and where are you going to put them and how are they going to interact with their environment and what is their environment going to do to them? They have not been exposed to the current range of bacteria, viruses and other pathogens for at least 65 million years and you might find they get knocked over by a common coronavirus like the common cold. Complicated. <laughs> So far, we've discovered zero life anywhere outside of Earth, apart from the UFOs, Area 51, we'll leave that to another time. But the big question is, 
Should the aliens come and be naughty and evil and hate us, should we construct giant robots to whom we are intricately linked? And we're talking the wonderful series Neon Genesis Evangelion, Evangelion, which I watch with my kids every stupid episode. So on one hand, you have these young, fit people who then become the pilots or drivers intimately married to these giant robots that then go out and do battle for the rest of humanity against these invaders. They're so intimately linked that on one hand, they control it beautifully and it obeys them in everything they tell it to do as they walk and stomp around and stab knives and stuff. But they feel the pain and they have a lifespan. You're better off with a dumb weapon like a bomb or a nuke. Why go to the trouble of making fingers and hands and tendons and motors when you can just, if you want to create destruction, some sort of bomb? But on the other hand, maybe the enemy is so sophisticated that they have ways of dealing with dumb weapons and even moderately smart weapons, and what they need is the, the ingenuity, the creativity and the unpredictability of a human. Is that the best way to go? It is a way to go, and once you immerse yourself into Saturday Night TV with the kids, it's the best way to go. Actually, it was a really good time. Thank you, kids, for introducing me to Neon Genesis. Uh, 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 Evan Kelly and thank you.